Hello, this is Mark Galliotti with another one of my episodic or sporadic musings on Russian politics. And clearly today on my mind are the protests that took place in Moscow yesterday, the exceedingly peaceful protests against fairly blatant attempts to rig local elections in the capital, and the very heavy-handed police response that followed. We had protesters, the size has been estimated everything from 10,000 to a little bit over 20,000, still makes it very substantial, but a massive more than 1,300 recorded arrests, which is certainly the biggest we've seen for about eight years, if not longer. Um, and not just the number of arrests, but also the, the way the police went in. I mean, they, they definitely had decided that it was time to, to make a demonstrative case to remind people of the force that was available to the, to the state. So they went in hard, they went in heavy, and this actually, I hesitate to express it as a sort of game changer or whatever, but nonetheless, I think it does pose a variety of key challenges for everyone involved. From the point of view, first of all, of the protesters, the question is, well, where do, where do you go now? I mean, first of all, let's be honest. If you are going to challenge an authoritarian regime, there's no reason to be surprised when it decides to get all authoritarian on you. Um, you know, this is what's going to happen now. Admittedly, this is a regime which, on the whole, has preferred not to come down as heavily as so many other regimes will. Putin and co. do not really want to be sitting on thrones of bayonets. But nonetheless, it is clear that they're willing to do so. Now, do the protesters... Well, one option is that they just simply think, oh my gosh, no, and go home. Or do they seek to push forward and hope to acquire momentum? Do they use, for example, the outrage at what happened yesterday to try and get bigger crowds out on the streets next weekend or whatever, or otherwise basically continue to push this to the point of almost trying to pose a challenge to the authorities saying, are you really willing to go down this route? Are you really willing to basically become this kind of regime? Or do you want to make concessions? Or else do they then use this as an opportunity to convert themselves into something different? Now, this has been one of the challenges time and time and time again, that we have a kind of a protest movement, which is precisely that. It is a generalised movement. It has no particular leadership. Yes, there is um, Alexei Navalny and his sort of embryonic political structures, but still, essentially, he's not in charge. He's not the boss. He is, at best, primus inter pares, um, first amongst equals. So, do they actually convert themselves into something different on the basis of that? I'm not yet seeing that, but it could well happen. A lot will depend, of course, though, on the authorities, because actually the key question is, since they have decided on this path, and I think probably because they feel they've made concessions, they make concessions over the church in Yekaterinburg, they make concessions over the protests about um, the journalist who was framed, Golunov, I think they, they fear momentum turning against them. And so just as they, they definitely sort of came down heavy on the protests, the march that followed Golanov's release, this time too, I think they just wanted to make it clear that concessions does not equal weakness. The point is this, once you start going down that road, it becomes increasingly difficult not to continue to pace along it. Um, Actually, what you do is when you come down heavy, you basically begin to divide your opposition between those people who are wanting to see some kind of change but not willing to go to the barricades for it, who are the overwhelming majority, and those who become a radicalised hardcore, who actually then will, will work and almost become the sort of subversives that you paint them in your, in your media. So, actually, after a certain point, you do not, no longer really have a viable option of stepping back and reaching some kind of deal with society. We're not yet at that point, or rather, the Kremlin is not yet at that point, but nonetheless, it is getting closer to it. And perhaps most interestingly, I mean, what this response says about the regime. First of all, I think we shouldn't forget the fact that their public claims about the extent to which such protests are supported, engendered, financed, and sometimes even strategized from abroad, is not totally for PR purposes. I think it does actually reflect a totally incorrect, but nonetheless genuine belief within the Kremlin. Secondly, I think it says something about how scared they are. Because think about it, I mean, this was all about a few uh, 
anti-government figures wanting to try and get on the ballot and quite possibly winning seats in the Moscow local legislature. It really would not have made any major difference. Yes, it would have been significant for them, it would have been something of a triumph for the protesters, absolutely. But would it really have changed the political scene? Not at all. In fact, could it have been leveraged as a proof that, you see, we're not an authoritarian regime at all, we're perfectly happy to have uh, critical voices, and probably would one, two, maybe all three of these figures have been, been potentially house-trained in due time? Who knows? But nonetheless, they, they didn't feel that they could or would take that route. Instead, they basically fell back on, on what they've got, which is, after all, force. And I said, I think that really says a degree something about the degree of fear to be found with it within the elite at the moment. And it's not a fear because they think they're going to be swept away by public protest. That's not going to happen. It very rarely happens anyway. Generally, revolutions, risings and so forth, they only succeed once the regime has had a critical absence of will. And that's the crucial point. It is not fear about what's on the streets. It's fear about what's happening in the offices and in the upscale restaurants and in the dacha kitchens of the oligarchs, the senior figures within the government and so forth. A sense that, in fact, if they look as if they're losing, then people jump ship. If they look as if they're losing, people look for alternative routes. People look for alternative leaders. And particularly at this moment when there is this kind of pervasive sense of uncertainty about the future, visible in all the various floated stories about different strategies for how Putin could handle the, the looming 2024 issue, whether he becomes a prime minister in a sort of more prime ministerialized political system, which is clearly being pushed um, by uh, the Lord in because he wants to, the Duma to become more powerful, um, whether he becomes chairman of a state council or whatever, or whether he finds a successor. You know, all of these are being floated, but all of these actually betray a certain lack of certainty about the future. And that is, I think, what is really dividing the elite and makes them particularly skittish. So, what's going to happen? Look, the regime is going to survive at least for the foreseeable future. The question is not about the survival, it's about the cost of surviving. Not just the, the economic cost, but the political cost of doing so. What do you have to do to make sure that you feel in power? And what's happening clearly is that this is a regime which for so long has tried to build at least the appearance of legitimacy and a sense amongst its own people that it may not be perfect, but, but basically it's, it's acceptable. Well, that legitimacy is being caused, and this is this is the sort of loss, and that's the, the the dilemma: power versus legitimacy. And this is, in some ways, the kind of dilemma that, that the Soviets faced. Um, we're once again at a point where Putin has a Brezhnevian choice before him: does he just simply want to hold on, whatever else, despite the costs, the costs that are going to be visible politically, economically, and socially? Or is he going to risk doing something different? Well, as I've said in past attempts to sort of present Putin's mind, I don't think he's a risk taker, ultimately. I think he will default to what seems to be the safest option. The safest option is just basically to hold the line. But in this respect, actually, the Brezhnevian choice is increasingly a cage, locking him in, locking in his policy choices. And also, in a way, beginning to define the whole 2024 issue. Because... The more fear there is about uncertainty, the more fear there is about the unknown, is the more it concentrates people's minds on post-Putin Russia. And for some, that means preparing themselves in case they have to be able to say, we were never really supporters of Putin. You see, here we have evidence that, in fact, we were always just going along with it because we had to, but in fact, our hearts were always out in the streets. And there are others who basically their idea of preparation is make damn sure there are enough water cannon available for the Roskvardia um, and basically prepare to, if need be, exactly sit on that throne of bayonets. So, again, I don't want to overstress this. This is not, I'm going to say, a turning point. This is part of a changing and evolving situation. But I think the fact that the authorities made a decision, and clearly it was a decision because it was telegraphed in advance by Sabyanin, mayor of Moscow, the fact that they had made this decision to come down so hard on what was, again, it's worth stressing, an entirely peaceful protest, says something, I think, about the mindset, the changing mindset, of a scared bunch of people in charge and what they feel they can need to do to hold on to power. Things could get bumpy. 
And on that upbeat note, thank you very much for listening.